There is more than meets the ear with mainstream music. Influential, pop music has become cheap and easy financial fuel for large record labels over the last 50 years detracting from quality musical experience, programming us to expect less of our own creativity and surroundings. Pop is a shortened term of the word, popular, meaning, of the people or majority. Popular music is considered to be the, heavy equipment, of influence for the average adolescent. It's inculcating teens' minds and perhaps everyone that is subjected to popular contemporary views and dictations of Western culture. Over time, creativity has been watered down, to keep record revenues up and, writers blocked down. Songs peddled out from major record labels have become a homogenization of familiar tones, tempos, timbers, pitches and transitions. The music industry and the powers that be are utilizing neuroscience and brain plasticity of the masses to popularize their hit singles for production and financial reasons. This is harmful when many of the songs hold no musical or artistic value, the lyrics and message are obscene, and many of the artists hold little concept of morality. Could contemporary pop music lead to a lack of creativity amongst listeners, thusly future artists? I will attempt to answer this question, and relate to facets of the issue with unbiased analysis and summary of the following, documented social psychologists' research, citing of a statistical physics study, measuring the evolution of contemporary Western popular music, and through the claims and studies of a few vocalized and concerned music and art enthusiasts. Despite common belief, pop hasn't always been considered a genre, or sub-genre, but an element of genre. There may be pop rock, pop country, pop R&B, rap, techno, ad infinitum. Yet, recently, a near globalized perception of contemporary pop music has incorporated a painful mixture of all genres into a louder, pitch-restricted, computerized, and familiar harmonic category. It is a category of composition, overutilized and stretched over the masses, into a plastic wrap, thin layer, of originality. Could this, thin layer, lead to a lack of creativity? When we are trending towards, the same old songs, just refashioned, musical backing and composition happily handed over to a computer or DJ, instead of the talents of the musician, when lyrics reflect merely love, heartbreak, drugs, partying, limelight, the music itself and, or the lifestyle that ensues, our culture reflects it. It's that reflection that has, music critics like Ted Joya claiming that music criticism has devolved into lifestyle reporting. How can we be concerned with our own creativity and growth if we are so involved in the lifestyles of the popular? The definition of creativity entails the ability to transcend traditional ideas, rules, patterns, and, or relationships and to create meaningful new forms, methods, interpretations, or simply stated, progressive imagination. Even for artists like Elvis, Led Zeppelin, Aretha Franklin, and the heroes of true American genres like blues and folk music, creation, of any kind, requires influence. Artists will encompass their art, music around that which they are familiar with, emotions they wish to convey, subjects they find stimulating, or to the tune of a pressing issue. Thusly, pop music is constantly evolving in the direction of humanity's interests. Paradoxically, the inverse effect is happening to the ebb and flow of our collective interests and culture perhaps by insidious intention of the music industry or yet, larger entities. We are being trained to love, like, or at least tolerate unattractive lyrics and uninspired homages to tune and harmony. Homages by musicians that we might not care for, care to listen to, or are confused to how they initially became popularized. According to gathered evidence of a study measuring the evolution of Western pop music, our perception of new is rooted on these changing characteristics, such as restriction of pitch transitions, the homogenization of the timbral palette and growing loudness levels. An old tune could sound perfectly novel and fashionable, provided that it consisted of common. Harmonic progressions, changed instrumentation, and increased average loudness. We're experiencing less variety in pitch progressions, frequent voice timbers becoming more frequent and louder volumes threatening our dynamic richness that has been conserved until today. Relatedly, based on an fMRI study in 2011, researchers discovered that the emotional centers of the brain including the reward centers are more active when people hear songs they've heard played before. In fact, those regions of the brain are more active than when people hear unfamiliar songs that might be more well-suited to their musical tastes. A couple dozen unintentional listens might cause many of us to change our initial outlook on a song. PBS Idea Channel's Mike Ragnetta explains it's akin to a musical Stockholm Syndrome. Common belief is that an individual hears a song so often, in so many places, because it is popular. This hasty generalization has led to an exoneration of and become an ex-pontifier of bad pop. 
The truth is, songs are popularized through media and pop culture before they are perhaps even the artist has truly become a majority favor or of the people. There is an explanation for this, and it is on the edge of ominous. Labels pay independent promoters to incentivize stations to play their music or create program caps radio to ensure a hit gets enough plays to have its effect. There's a legitimate neuroscience within the strategy. If you hear something enough, you'll start to like it. Other scientific factors matter just as much, though. The context in which you hear a song is frequently as important as the properties and content of the song itself so far as communicating meaning and the more often it's introduced or exposed to us the more chances we receive to install positive associations, regardless of the expressed intentions of the artist. Therefore songs that the industry foists upon us constantly have a more successful opportunity to become popular than ones without the music industry machine backing them up. Conclusively, we have an insignificant notion of control as to why we like the things we do. This and multiple other social and cognitive factors make it effortless for the pop music industry to obtain an audience to artists they decide are worthy of promotion. And once we've been introduced and repetitively slammed with an artist for a small amount of time, there is no turning back. History ridden, masses hooked, manipulation at its finest. The industry knows this well, and practice it constantly. The functionality of the manipulation, intermittent repetition, can be interpreted through the mere exposure effect. Also known as familiarity principle the more exposure we have to certain stimulus, the more we tend to like it. Tastes become acquired. Fondness found in choices made within the parameters of the familiar. Better the devil you know, as they say. The stimulus can be anything people, commercial products, places, proverbs, so on and so forth. We can even grow accustomed to unpleasant things instances of prisoners missing prison. Exposure may also be overdone. After a number of exposures, we might ignore the message. If exposures proceed, we may become irate and take revenge by assuming negative responses to the message. The disgraced downfallen world of subliminal messaging and exploitation is inextricably tied to the exposure effect, increasing chances of liking through predatory means. Adverts also use this effect. By repeated exposure, viewers gradually like the product without ever having tried it. It is easy to become bored and sick of endlessly repeated ads, so advertisers will regularly switch up the ad, therefore giving rise to another highly profitable industry. So when you see something over and over, wonder why. Take notice if someone or some organization is presenting that something to you. Decide consciously about what you like. If I have seen further it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Isaac Newton once said, Essentially expressing that we, modern society, are like dwarfs standing on the shoulders of giants, our successful predecessors. We create from, build off of, sample, and remix what they have already created. Familiarity breeds comfort and liking, not only in music, but also person's face or personality, for example. 
The following two names may not be familiar, however they happen to be giants of which I base my thesis around. Robert Zayens is a Polish scholar best known for developing the theory of mere exposure effect. In the 1960s, a series of laboratory experiments by Zayens demonstrated that simply exposing subjects to a familiar stimulus led them to rate it more positively than other, similar stimuli which had not been presented. According to Zayens, the Mary Exposer effect is capable of ensnaring without conscious cognition, and that, preferences need no inferences. This means that we don't need to be aware of the Nicki Minaj song playing in the background, our subconscious is still working at setting up automatic linkages for that song, tune, lyrics and all the information we receive in between the lines. Research shows that after an average of 7 repetitions, our subconscious minds will produce automatic linkages within the constructs of memory and pleasure. These linkages become part of our automatic response to stimuli, making information and emotion readily available whenever it is consciously called upon or unknowingly registered. The music industry has been profiting from this neuroscience for decades now, and with the rise of the internet and music apps, music industry revenues are up. Plus 0.3% for the first time in a decade. The other aforementioned professional is Adrian North of Harriet Watt University. In 2008, he published the largest study of musical taste yet, accounting for 36,000 participants, 60 countries, and three years of research. He asked each person to list their favorite genres of music and take a short personality quiz. He discovered that the most common characteristic among all genre listeners was creativity. However, one group of listeners revealed a distinguished lack of creativity, pop music enthusiasts. That does not mean that only stupid people love pop, just that pop trains us to expect less from our artistic and creative lives. Adrian's colleagues and he found that preferred music style is tied to personality and certain traits. For example, blues fans frequently have high self-esteem, are creative, outgoing, gentle and at ease. In contrast, chart pop fans often have high self-esteem, are hardworking, outgoing and gentle, but are not creative and not at ease. In a study done by Virgil Griffiths, published in 2009 at his website, Music That Makes You Dumb, he claims that after listening to pop music after a while, he had a thought. Wow, loving this rubbish says a lot about someone and how much they got going on in their head. As he studied the 133 out of 1,455 most popular artists and genres from 1,352 schools, he recorded the SAT scores and musical preferences of each student interviewed. Mean SAT across the schools is 1071 out of 1,600. Not surprisingly, lovers of classical, like Beethoven, have an average score of 1380, opposed to Lil Wayne listeners around 870, in between, we have gospel music at 925, and the Beatles enthusiasts with an average score of 1140. If parts of our personality and intelligence are grounded in our musical preference, why would we subject ourselves to the horrendous content matter of many mainstream pop songs? What has happened to creativity and originality the novel? The transcension of traditional ideas, rules or patterns might not sound appealing to the lowest common denominator of society. So creativity wallows in a pathetic pit waiting for enough people to break the mindless mold. In the meantime, popular music will continue to be manufactured and exploited for fast easy financial gains subtracting from our own creativity and Mankin's musical expression as a whole. We are being programmed, subliminally and subconsciously. Are we losing our choice, our control? Could we be on a destined path to a single song, a musical destination, not decided by us? Like the Song of Songs for Profit Profits. 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 Like the Song of Songs for Profit Profits.
Like the song of songs for profit, profit, like the song of songs for profit, song of songs for profit, like the song of songs for profit, profit, like the song of songs for profit, like the song of songs for profit, song of songs for profit, profit, like the song of songs, like the song of songs for profit, 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 like the song of songs, like the song, like the song, like the song of songs for profit, profits.